how many mini PCs are truly mini PCs and how many of those mini PCs have something special like this. This is the High Goal Gold 2 mini PC. So you're looking at the special thing right now. It's got a 5.5 inch touchscreen and this is an IPS screen. I think it looks pretty good. 1280 by 800. And at this size, that means a couple of different things to my brain. I'm always thinking like, what other resolutions can you run this at? Well, half of that would be 640 by 400. So if you wanted to play some emulators and stuff on a small screen like this, they'll, you know, they're still going to look really good um, at that resolution. So you got five multi-touch and 300 ANSI lumens on this. And they say it works even if you're using gloves or have wet hands. So that's kind of cool. Now, speaking of wet, this is a very industrial looking uh, computer. And maybe it has some industrial applications, but let's just go through all the specs quickly and then we'll just try it out and see what all, you know, see what all we can do with it. Let me show you something right here. You see that price? That's what a retail key costs. That's silly. I always get OEM keys because they work and they're a fraction of the cost. And right now I use whokeys.com to unlock my copies of Windows. I've been heavily advocating for the LTSC versions of Windows because they don't have recall, they don't have any bloat, they don't have any spyware. The Windows 10 LTSC IoT has extended support until 2032. And then we have Windows 11, which is very similar to 10 once you strip all the nonsense off of it. And that has support until October 10th, 2034. You also have Windows 11 Pro and Windows 11 Home. And just ignore these prices, we're gonna make them better. We got Windows 10 Pro, but we're at the end of life on that. So just, I would recommend grabbing IoT. And then we have two different flavors of Office, Office 2016 Pro and Office 2019. These are offline versions. So you don't have to pay the monthly subscription fee. You just do the one-time fee. And then, you know, you're not gonna have Copilot installed inside your copy of Office that's always, you know, watching your stuff, which is weird that Microsoft is doing that now. But yeah, this is a way to get around all that. Just don't sign in with your Microsoft account. So look at all these prices. We've got a coupon over here for the Halloween sale, but let's just go through Windows 11 Pro and I'll show you how to save even more money with coupon code TS25. Let's go ahead and check out with our copy of Windows 11 Pro. I right, just put in my card info. There we go. Click on view keys and codes. Once you get to the user center, click on get the key. You'll see your key right here in the middle. Go ahead and highlight that, copy that. All right, here we just need to press start and then type activate. You'll see activation settings. Go ahead and click on that. And then right here it says not active. That's okay. Just click on change product key. Paste in our product key, press next, and then click on activate. Hey, look at that, active. Now I can come back over here and change my wallpapers and everything else, great. Don't be messing around with those exorbitant retail keys. Grab an OEM key. Head over to whokeys.com. Thanks to them for sponsoring. And now on to our regularly scheduled program. So the version that I have right here has the Intel N5995. Now the 5995 is uh, Celeron 2021. It uses about 15 watts. So this is the interesting thing to me because this also has, has like a 2500 milliamp hour uh, battery on the inside. Now the N5995 uh, is a a weird choice i mean it's going to be less expensive than like an n100 but an n100 is like half the power draw and it's a little bit faster so maybe they're just doing it because it's a better price point and, and you know a lot of people that's going to be fine for them and you can do a lot with it so we'll test it out but you know this used to be the, the intel called the seller on but they've I, I believe intel has just completely moved away from the naming scheme the seller on naming scheme so Whatever. Ever since the olden days, Celeron was always kind of a bad word. Like, oh, it's a Celeron. Oh, we got a new Intel, but it's a Celeron. Hmm. Four megabytes of our L3 cache there. Then we have eight gigabytes of DDR4. And there's our Intel UHD graphics. It's got one gigabyte. It's sharing, I believe. That's how these things work. Our network ports. Let's take a look at those. We've got a Realtek RTL8168, uh, 8111. That's our gigabit Ethernet port. And then our uh, wireless LAN. It's the Realtek RTL 8821CE, and that'll give us wireless AC. And this one comes with 128 gigabytes internal ROM memory. So it's uh, not an M.2, and we'll test the speeds on that in just a second. It has an all metal shell, and it's it feels really good in your hands. It's sturdy, it's very well made. 5.6 inches by 3.6 inches by 0.7 inches. And in the rest of the world, it's 14.2 centimeters by 9.1 centimeters by 1.9 centimeters. And the weight is 32 kilograms, <laughs> 0.32 kilograms. Easy to carry, they say on their website. It's like the size of a phone. Actually, it's smaller than a lot of the phones out there. You all carrying around VCR sized phones talking about how nice it is to have a a nice little portable computer in your pocket. Well, this is smaller than a lot of phones. Even it's a little bit thicker, but all right. Let's go through the ports. So um, the front's sleek and clean. Just got a little intake there. And then on the side, we have an SD card slot and then two USB 3 
and then we have an earphone jack right there. It's output only, not microphone. Flipping it around to the back, we have USB 3.1, that's USB Type-C 3.1. Then we have HDMI 2.0. We have two more USB 3, and then we have uh, RJ45, that's your LAN port there. It's 1000 megabits per second. And uh, the power buttons here, I keep, keep saying it to the back because it's got all the buttons, but the power buttons on this side. Uh, and then we also have uh, another Type-C that is just DC input for your, um, you know, to power it on and all that stuff. Comes with a little uh, wall board, I guess, in the box that's USB-C. Now, one of the things that's kind of cool is if you want to do a full-on CMOS reset, um, you can reset that using short presses of the power button. So the version that they gave me, it came with Windows 11. I highly recommend throwing Linux on this. As long as you have a version of Linux that works well with the five-point multi-touch screen, you're going to be just fine, but you'll you know, be able to get more performance with, uh, you know, without having to have as much RAM. All right, let's hop in and do all of our tests, and then we're also going to play a bunch of games because that's what I like to do. Let's take a look at Unigen Valley. Now, this only scored 6.9 with a score of 290. 6.9 FPS, that is. Minimum FPS, 4.6. It's not going to be doing 3D gaming. That's just... Uh, you know, the bottom line here with this, but I wanted to test this because I do all the mini PCs on 1080p high and that way you can take a look at all the different ones and just see the difference and if you wanted to test at home and just see how different this is compared to like one of your old computers or something, well by all means fire it up and test. When it comes to Cinebench it's kind of interesting. The uh, single core performance is better than I expected. I mean it's still down toward the bottom at a score of 560, but you know, it's got a little bit of burst power right there. A little bit of something going on, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. The multi-core score, uh, again, this is four cores, and they're all, uh, you know, not too wild. Our score here is 1852. Looking at Geekbench, our single core score is 492. I think this might be the lowest core that I've seen, but that's not really the purpose of this machine. And then the uh, multi-core score is 1354. I'll scroll down there so you can take a look at the individual tests. And then over here on our OpenCL score, we've got 1787. And again, I'll scroll down. There's the individual tests. Oh, good Lord! This is hot. So this is Ada 64. Look at that throttling like crazy. Um, it's gone all the way up to 94 degrees, which, I mean, these can do. These are like little laptop CPUs, but this is just so hot. I, I don't like it. Not at all. So, um... I, I don't think you should be running this for rendering or anything. Now, when you're doing just regular stuff, it's not gonna be this big of a deal. But yeah, we are getting way too much thermal throttling, uh, in my opinion, and it's really hot and it's quite loud. So let's test the uh, the fans. All right, if we're just chilling at my desk right here, it's 43.9 decibels. So I'm gonna put this uh, kind of close to the, the computer and we'll see how loud it is. All right, I didn't think it was actually this loud. I mean, you can hear it. You know, I didn't think it was going to be this loud, but it's it's pretty loud. It sounds like a miniature, um, I guess, turbine engine or a jet engine. It doesn't like ramp up and down, so at least there's that. But it is loud and kind of sharp and not pleasant. It's kind of the nature of things when you've got stuff that's this small. Let's check the speed on that internal EMMC memory. Uh, this is like your hard drive. It's 128 gigabytes, but you can get 256 or 512 or whatever. And as you can clearly see here, they have prioritized power consumption over speed because this is, you know, it's a hard drive. It's like twice as fast as a regular spinning disk hard drive, but it's, uh, you know, like one tenth as fast as most M.2, but it's only pulling 0.76 watts. So I think that's the real focus here. We're not getting a, a readout over here when it comes to, uh, you know, like temperatures or anything, the drive information is all right here, but yeah, there's no readout there. We can go over here and take a look at the drive. Just a little SATA drive right here. It is a generic. That's all the information. I've never seen this before. That's interesting. So I guess this little EMMC just not given any information to hardware info. It's just a generic 128 gigabyte um, SV8. Interesting. When it comes to gaming on this machine, I'm not going to do like strict benchmarks because it's not going to compare to a lot of the other things I test. So I just want to see what we can play on this because I think that's all that matters when it comes to a system like this. You know, you want to see, can I play this? So we're looking at an indie game right now called Heartworm. And it's the first game I wanted to try out because it's new. It's made in Unity. It's got a cool pixel aesthetic. Kind of reminds me of the old PlayStation games, except without all the, the Z uh, buffer weirdness, the flickering. 
Now, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip around. My audio was bad on the recording, so you'll see me skip around a little bit. If you like Fatal Frame or you know, Resident Evil, Silent Hill, those types of games, and you want something that's like that, but maybe a little bit more indie, uh, maybe less combat. The combat's all camera centric. You do have a camera. But yeah, see, look at that interface. That's straight out of Silent Hill 2, huh? Anyway, if you run it in this pixelated mode, it runs really well on this system. Now you can actually turn the pixelization off. All right, so I turned off the pixelization and you have to, uh, you know, use the flash on your camera to see where you're going. And now you can see it's not nearly as fluid. So let's turn the pixelization back on. And now we're running around completely uh, fluidly again. It's interesting because a lot of games just do a pixel filter on top of whatever else is there. This one doesn't do it that way. It like crunches down the resolution so it runs really well even on a CPU like this. All right, so let's move on. I wanna try another new indie game. Everyone's playing that uh, new Ninja Gaiden. Well, check this out. It's more of a grindy rogue light, I guess. Every time you die, you respawn and you can like get some new tools and stuff to take uh, take on all the hordes of enemies. Anyway, this is Katanaut and um, a lot crunchier, a lot more uh, involved than a lot of the games like this. I'm playing with mouse and keyboard right now, which reminds me a lot of the old game um, called Abuse, because you have the little reticle there to target, things are leaping at you, uh, you're not shooting and all that. I mean, you can get different, all kinds of different weapon upgrades and stuff. I'm probably gonna die here because I'm not paying attention, but yeah. It's bloody and brutal and kind of interesting and fun, and it runs really well on this machine for the most part. When there's a lot of enemies, you're gonna start to slow down. It's playable, but I maybe wouldn't. All right, let's try some DOS box. Um, I forgot how uh, just janky this game is when you try to control it. This is uh, Under a Killing Moon, one of the Tex Murphy games. And I, yeah, it's first person and it's just so awkward. You have to like move your mouse around and that moves you through the 3D world. It's very strange, I forgot. So yeah. But it, it works, you know, and I'm, I'm playing it. Of course, Doc's box is gonna work. I just wanted to show it off. Now, as far as the other emulators go, I wanted to try some of the ones that require a little bit more uh, power. We're playing Brandish here on the PSP and Brandish works just fine. Brandish is a very interesting game because you're always walking forward and you press L and R to turn the world. So it's kind of a grid-based dungeon crawler that well, they're telling you right there. I think it's kind of fun and it runs really well on this system, so. Yeah, PSP games will work on this. We're gonna go a little bit crazier and try some GameCube with Metroid Prime. Can we play Metroid Prime? Pardon me, I forgot how to, how to play this. It's been a while, I forgot how the controls work. So you know what, Metroid Prime, it feels great and it looks just fine. So you can actually play Metroid Prime on this machine. That's how far along emulation has come. There we go, look at those corridors. Runs especially well in these corridors, but I think the effects look, look cool. I wouldn't mind, uh, you know, a 3D game like this coming out nowadays. It's got some charm. So yeah, you can actually play a lot of different things on this Celeron CPU. So I'm somewhat impressed. All right, so there you have it. I think the novelty is really the screen. And that could come in handy for a number of different scenarios and reasons, many that I don't even, I can't even think about. But you tell me how you would use this. I'm very curious, like, what would this do for you? Like, what application, you know, in your life would this be perfect for? So. For me, I wish they'd gone with an Intel N100 or an N97 or some slightly more modern CPU, but that would have made the price go up just a tiny bit, but I think that would have been okay because longer battery life, a little bit faster performance, power savings, that goes right along with long battery life. But you know, as it is the Celerons, okay, I keep calling it Celeron for N559, or whatever it is, it's fine. It, it'll do just fine, it's four cores you know, not hyper-threaded or anything. So it'll get the job done for a lot of the stuff that you're doing. Anyway, let me know what you think of this. And uh, would you like to see more of these little utility type PCs? Let me know in the comments. See you next time.